He's back in the hot seat. Find out what makes Dick Rosen tick. He's back for part two on this morning's Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at the Fox 43 studio. We're visiting with Dick Rose and we're on part two, a little bit of the capacitor business, which for folks who weren't with us yesterday, Dick, may not have a feel of, but we were getting into a little bit of some of the background of capacitors and how they've impacted not only uh, the uh, across the board in the electronics industry, but of course one of the things you mentioned off camera yesterday after we wrapped up was that aspect of someone having brought you in uh, last March to an event, to, to a conference, you were the keynote speaker, highlighting kind of a 45-year perspective on the changes within the industry. I think they were just looking for somebody who was old and was still around. <laughs> who could fill the... But it was kind of interesting because it makes you reflect on what's happened in the particularly I studied in electrical engineering and uh, it's a bit different if you think it's hard to imagine you know forget about cell phones we didn't have dial we didn't have digital phone we didn't have only computers were huge things that, that uh, scientific institutions IBM AT&T guys like that may have had them uh, you know, had them in the, in the large universities but nobody knew what a computer was right uh, I mean, that's the greatest extremes, but which have almost everything in between. I mean, electronic watches, I don't know when electric watches came about, but it wasn't electronic. I mean, there was so many, uh, it's, it was really hard for me to imagine black and white TV would, had just come into South Carolina. Uh, when I left for school, which was 54, that uh, Greg, just, you just mentioned, they just opened a station in Charleston down in Georgetown. We used to occasionally get Charlotte, one of, we, my grandfather sold them, so we had a TV set. And when the clouds were right, you could get TV. But I mean, he's a, it's hard to imagine a day of uh, the lack of digital systems in, in total. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first computers we saw developed, uh, uh, this, this guy named Steve Jobs came up with this Apple thing, and then there was a uh, Commodore and companies like that, which nobody even knew. Most people today never heard of. Yeah, I remember the first Bomar handheld calculator, and of course TI and a lot of folks made lots of them, and then they ended up most of them. Well, I think all of them made in Asia today. But I still have an old Bomar calculator, which is about three cigarette packs big, and probably cost a couple hundred dollars, and <laughs> add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and that's it. And it may have had a memory. I'm not even sure. But, <laughs> but it's it just a, you know it goes on and on and on. Uh, there weren't jet. I don't remember when the first jet planes came into being commercially, but they were not. They were around that time frame. Sure. Uh, I went to school from Charleston in an old piston engine Martin 404. It took about a week to get to Boston. And, uh, a lot of changes. Yeah. One, of course, for viewers who were with us yesterday, they know obviously you, Dick Rosen, the retired chief executive officer of AVX grew up in Georgetown, in the city of Georgetown. You were just mentioning that yeah. your uh, your grandfather was a merchant there. I know you shared yesterday that your father and, and uncle uh, had been attorneys. Your father was an attorney, your uncle's still so practicing. What was that like growing, again, for, for viewers who weren't with this yesterday, growing up in Georgetown and then heading off in 1954, which was, of course, a big year, a uh, big year in the South, a big year in the country, and attending school in Cambridge, Massachusetts? Uh, it was, uh, well, Georgetown was home, and I mean, everybody loves home, and it was great life growing up, and had lots of good friends, many of whom we're still friendly with. Uh, we built a house down at Pauley's Island a few years ago and got re reunited with a few. Right. But uh, it was it was a wonderful life, and uh, I, there's a long story of why I went to school in Boston, but that's not really so important, but it was a an enormous shock. Yeah. Uh, when your high school, MIT was, a, I think I was just lucky to survive. Uh, but uh, but the whole experience was pretty phenomenal. The exposure to a big city. I've been a Yankee fan, so I wasn't impressed with the Red Sox. <laughs> but we used to sneak over and sneak through the fence. They'd let us go in and watch games. But it was a great experience. I mean, 
For Excuse big, me. yeah, a big international school like MIT must bring folks from not only all over the world, but particularly all over the U.S. So there's probably a lot of folks coming out of small, I mean, not necessarily like a USC, a University of South Carolina, which would have a lot of folks from South Carolina, right. or UNC. From all over. I mean, folks from all over, many coming out of small towns, I guess, or, or no. Yeah. Well, the, the biggest number would have come from, you're talking about a, a, a unique school, not good or bad, but you a technical school, mm -hmm. and you had more people would come from technical universities, or technical high schools, there's Bronx Science and Brooklyn Tech and New York, and there's schools like that in Chicago and most of the big cities. And the technology was not as big a thing then. Today there are a lot of engineers in you know, Silicon Valley a few years ago, what have you. But I don't think, I think I had one other kid in my class, and there weren't a lot of us, it was 69, it studied engineering, mm. and everybody else did something else. So the technology wasn't such a big deal. So you didn't have, you certainly had people from everywhere, but it were, there weren't that many technical students. So it wasn't that it was MIT, it just mm -hmm. weren't that many technical students. You know, a lot of folks, Dick, I'm sure must wonder that, and, and, and would probably want to ask you that. You know, you think about having ascended to the chief executive officer's position at AVX, having gotten to worldwide 20-some thousand employees. One of the questions folks would ask was, what was your first childhood job? Can you think back to, was it sure. working in your grandfather's? No, I was delivering circulars for the baseball team in the summer. I organized a bunch of kids with bikes, and we had these circulars, and we did, you know, just promoting the... Uh, the baseball game. That was my first. I don't know if we got paid. But that was my first job. <laughs> that you definitely remember. How about your first job as an adult? Was it after MIT or? Well, with my, I, uh, I worked in high school. I worked for my grandfather. Right. Put up TV antennas later and delivered refrigerators and whatever. The whole. It's hard to imagine, but there was electricity was just being delivered in this area to what we call the country, but the, the back roads which have developed tremendously since then. And we'd fill a refrigerator with uh, a truck with refrigerators, and we'd go out in the country and sell them to people that had a, a hanging bulb from the ceiling. We'd have a screw-in socket that you could screw the bulb in, and you had two plugs on either side and an extension cord and hook up a refrigerator. Dang. I guess that was my first real job. And it was great because you met a lot of nice people. Yeah, and, sure. And it was to see, uh, you know, a lot of them wouldn't have running water, have pumps, wells, whatever. So, Stuff you'd never forget, and I'm well, sure. And today it's just, uh, you know, everything has changed. I mean, fortunately, I mean, it's great because people have advanced, but it was a great experience seeing part of our, our area evolve into this century, if you would. Yeah, yeah it's the fascinating thing about thinking you can still go down dirt roads in Georgetown County, but get to a home where they're using wireless internet. I mean, right. you know, to uh, <laughs> sure the impact of, uh, of, of surely electric, electronics in, in the world. We'd gotten into capacitors a little bit yesterday, Dick. We began talking about AVX's primary role, and I know we won't, won't ask you to explain that again. One of the fascinating things there we talked about uh, off camera yesterday was that aspect of the Kyocera Corporation. Uh, and a little bit yesterday, you shared that the 70 percent of uh, AVX currently is held by Kyocera right. Corporation. That's based out of Japan. Right. And of course, are you, a, uh, are you and Brenda Japanese speakers? No. I, at one point, I could understand quite a bit, but I could communicate. I can't anymore. There's a lot of nodding and shaking. No, hands. but there's yeah. a lot. I mean, I think one of the things you learn when you travel is you learn to listen. And if you listen, it's amazing how much you, if you, I mean, I spent a lot of time, and I probably spent oh, for over 10 or 15, we had a company before Kyocera uh, in Japan, and I spent a lot of time there, and, uh, and when you're alone at, at, in a place and nobody speaks English, you learn to communicate, mm -hmm. and so we did that, but, uh, and a lot of it's learning to listen. I'm sure you've probably said it before, I recently heard Brad Dean say it, a good reason we have two ears and one mouth that aspect of listening twice as much as we speak. How about some of the current hurdles for AVX going forward? Some of the things in the industry that uh, I know obviously you talked about over the last five years, a lot of the capacitors y'all are putting out, we're going into equipment, y'all are enablers, I think you stressed right. yesterday, going into equipment that sat on shelves for a couple of years, but now y'all are probably at a point where people are... Well, that's, that's pretty much gone. I, I think a year or so ago, that was maybe even a year and a half, two years ago, we, we started the building phase. The industry started building new stuff, and 
Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of development. You talk about uh, new telephone systems. That, that's a big thing. And the, the uh, computer industry continues to evolve and change models and specs and what have mm -hmm. you. Uh, but the communication part of the business is probably the biggest part. And AVX makes a, a number of uh, unique products that they sell to the industry, which help us in, with some of these marketplaces. Mm -hmm. And I think the, uh, the biggest problem everybody has in our industry, unlike most products, uh, the prices of things electronic go down every year. Mm -hmm. You talk to somebody, you see this $5,000 big flat screen TV, and it's, well, we'll wait till next year, and it'll be 3000 Right. And that's why we've grown so much. I mean, the industry's grown more than anything else. But it's also the biggest challenge, and it's cost down, reducing the cost to produce a product and still being able to make a profit. Yeah. And that's a challenge to the industry. You know, I've talked to some of the large TV manufacturers over the years, and you would think they made a lot of money in TVs, and they didn't. You know, RCA is gone. Right. Zenith is gone. Magnum, they have, they have, they're still there, but somebody bought them. Because they didn't make any money. Right. And I think that the, the challenge, and AVX has been pretty good at doing it over the years, and, you know, we make more money some years and less others. But with the exception of the few years with the inventory cor correction, mm -hmm. you've been able to generate a profit. And I think that the challenge will always be in our industry. Obviously, the, the deliver products, new products, uh, state-of-the-art, uh, good products is a challenge. But to make money in the electronics industry is truly the biggest challenge. Who would be y'all's biggest competitors? Are there names that we'd know on, on a worldwide basis? Or do a lot of folks in this area know a, a, about AVX just because it's headquartered here? Well, well, one of our, it's not really our biggest competitor. Anymore. It was at one time a big competitor. It was a company called Kemet, which is in the western part of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And their product line is very similar to ours. We today make a lot more than they did. But a few years ago, that wasn't true. Very similar. Uh, but Kemet is is slipped from a leader. We still are a leader, and there are companies which probably wouldn't have heard of, Kyocera, I mean, excuse me, uh, Murata, who, there's no reason why you would have heard right. of Murata. Right. There's another company called TDK, which you would have hear, heard of mm -hmm. because they make uh, magnetic tape, and sure. when you use the uh, old uh, VCR, that was, you had TDK tape. Yes. But they're also big in our industry. And the other company, they, those are Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, their companies in, in China and Taiwan, Europe, uh, mostly now, uh, Shea is a company which people, mm -hmm. again, we don't make consumer products. Sure. So you, are, nobody, nobody knows who makes the stuff from which people make things that they buy. They that's right. Make. I mean, you don't know who makes carburetors for General Motors. You wouldn't recognize them unless you happen to be a... A car, you know, mechanic, a car mechanic sure, or, or something. And it's the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But our biggest competitors are not U.S. companies today. And, of course, as you mentioned, I mean, kind of Sarah, again, having a big stake in you all. You all are a publicly traded company, right. and, uh, and surely there are a lot of folks in the area that benefit from that, as well as uh, over, over the many years. Uh, I think you stressed yesterday you all were a public company until 90 when Kyocera purchased, and then in 95, based on y'all's of you all, of internal success, you were able to go public again. Well, one of the interesting things about, and it's interesting, they call it a merger, but they bought us. I mean, mm -hmm. but, uh, but they really supported our people, and uh, they, the shareholders did very well. But one of the most important things long term is it gave us a wider variety of products to represent to our customers and made us more valuable. We said the shopping basket had more products in it. Mm -hmm. And that helped us a lot back in 90 when we started the relationship. And we were able to become much, much, we were able to become much more valuable suppliers to many large companies around the world, which uh, we may have been suppliers, but to a much lesser extent and enable us not only to sell the products that they had that we could then sell and help them too. It helped mm -hmm. both. 
but it enabled us to sell more of the products that we produced as well. Speaking about around the world, during your 10-year tenure, tenure there as CEO, to think about y'all's expansion around the world, both building in new places as well as buying other outfits. Can you share with the viewers, I want to get a little bit to some of the things you've been doing locally since your retirement as the CEO, because we've got about 10 minutes. Okay. Time really flies, but can you just share with the viewers about AVX's expansion around the world, both in building as well as buying uh, during that 10 year tenure? As well, well it's been 30 years. Or much so longer, I mean, sure. I'll include the 30 years. Uh, the first place we now we built a, a manufacturing facility in uh, San Salvador. That was our first venture in 76. And actually, our first venture was a small operation in England, mm -hmm. which was, pr it was a little manufacturing, but it was primarily to get into sales in Europe. That was about 73 or four, mm -hmm. four, I think. And then we went to Salvador, and then we built plants in Mexico. We built plants in Northern Ireland. We, bought, uh, we built a plant in Jerusalem to make some special products in 1980. And we bought some companies. We, we, uh, we bought a company that made this product I mentioned in the earlier show, Talum Capacitors. Mm -hmm. It was in England and Germany. It's now We've located it to Czech. We have plants in Czech. We have plants in, uh, we bought a connector company, which has plants in England and mm. in Germany. What else did we do? We, have, we bought a company that had some operations in Brazil. Again, the impact of this, Dick, for locals, either our viewers in Lumberton and Laurenburg watching, or viewers in the PD, or here in Ori and Georgetown County, to think of the impact of a Myrtle Beach-based co corporation purchasing companies all over the world, the companies we, we don't speak those native languages or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And to think about the impact of our folks traveling around the world to visit those people and knowing that we try to bring them to this area, it's incredible. Well, it's been, it's been a very interesting, and for me a very exciting experience, and for most of AVX people. I mean, it's, it's certainly not any way suggesting I did it. A whole bunch of folks did right, it together. It was course. a team that did it. Sure. But, but we've got... Uh, I was trying to figure, I think we now have manufacturing in 12 countries. Uh, and uh, we've been in a lot of them for a long time. We've been in uh, San Salvador since 1976. We've been in England since 80. We opened uh, 79 and plant in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem was 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done and those are still going strong and, uh, yeah. and doing well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of team building, of course, you think about the corporate uh, officers and managers working hard to make some of those purchases and accretive as, as fast as possible. You know, you've been working in a team format in the recent past on something on the other side of the waterway or uh, something that a, a lot's gone into that. Can you give the viewers a little sense of where you all stand right now on the proposed uh, uh, Hard Rock theme park, Dick? Do I have it right there? Yep. Uh been reading a lot about it recently. And of yeah, course, we've and, had uh, some interesting uh, Had a lot headlines. going on. Uh, I, I, think I, I, I mean, let me just briefly uh, tell you where we are. We've been working on this thing now for uh, three and a half, four years. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. And there are basically just four of us that have put money in it. There's a little bit from other people, but pretty minimal. And it's all our money at this point. We have not asked anybody else to invest because we didn't want to do it unless we thought it was going to work. We have not been able to completely finance the project, although it's, that we are trying to. It's not done. It's, it's not dead. Let me put it that way. It's very active, as a matter of fact. We're going down to Florida on Friday to talk to some folks. But the recent, uh, I describe it as, as a fiasco, and I somewhat apologize to everyone for the way it turned out. It was not none of the, uh, the representations that were made were close to being true. What we really did was we, we told the county, we went to partners, which is a, I don't know what the relationship is with the county council, but there, there is some, and they suggested we pursue this, uh, this bond issue. Uh, so we asked the county council if, they, if we could discuss it and if they thought it would be something that would be interesting, uh, we would pursue it. We had not made any application. They asked us to come to a council meeting, and I think that's what probably triggered the thing in the wrong sort of way. Mm -hmm. And we said we were going to pursue it, but what we really meant was we're going to ask you if you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, the proposal we made, which I think is a good one, but, you know, I'm, I'm not totally objective about <laughs> this. We said we will give you the total taxes in this area, and I'll get off, get off this soapbox in just a minute. In that area, 
$80,000 a year. Right now, coming out of the That's uh, all existing coming out of the area we're talking about. Uh, what we proposed is we would, the estimated taxes by the county we would pay, just the real estate taxes, were about $2.5 million. Wow. So the $2.5 million would fund a $30 million bond. What we proposed, we asked the county if they would like to consider it. And they've been very supportive. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not a negative about any of the council. Sure. But they've been very supportive of this project. We said, we will give you at least a half a million dollars more. The bond issue, you pay that money and, it's, and it retires the bond, so right. there's no confusion. We said, we'll give you at least a half a million dollars more than whatever that number is. Plus, the, the state's estimate and the county's estimate of other taxes, which this would generate a, a $13, 14000000 million. I saw that. Mm. So the county is going to, quote, lose $2.5 million and pick up $14 million as mm. opposed to 80000 And that doesn't, and the number of jobs it creates are pretty substantial. A number of them are very good full-time jobs with benefits. Mm. The bond, if we were able to do it, if the county wants to do it, would be, would be first of all, guaranteed by a bank so there's no risk. Mm. And the uh, county has first dibs on the property mm. to pay the, and it's basically property taxes so it i think it's it Sounds can't like lose. a no brainer yeah and we didn't we didn't want to ask and we haven't asked unless they want us to but it was the we didn't know how to get the rest of the money so we we asked which i don't think is a is betraying any public trust and what we asked was a private meeting to discuss whether we should formally ask for it. Then it would be public. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it got kind of out of hand, and I think nobody really understood what happened. And uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to explain it. But it was, it, was a, it was a request of the council to see if they thought it was a reasonable thing to do, ensuring that they would get more money than they get now, and ensuring that there was no way they could lose any money because a bank would guarantee it. Mm -hmm. We can't guarantee it because we have that much money, but the bank would guarantee it. So we thought it was a reasonable thing to see if it was of interest to the council. There, there have been a lot of po problems in politics everywhere, certainly mm -hmm. Horry County is, mm -hmm. and we didn't want to embarrass anybody, and we still don't. And if it goes away, it's fine. It goes away. Dick, how much acreage are we talking about? And, and, 150 and acres. 150 acres. For, again, for our viewers in southeastern North Carolina and the PD, they're traveling down 501. Before they hit the waterway, it's just it's 150 where, acres on the right. It's, it's the land in back of Water, Water, Waccamaw Pottery. Waccamaw Pottery, okay. Including Mall 3, and, and an aban which is basically abandoned, and the Ice right. Castle, which is abandoned. Sure. It, does it impact medieval times and the churches back there? Uh, Medieval Times would be delighted. Yeah. Oh, uh, sure. One of the churches would be, neither one of the churches object to it. There's some concerns about traffic. Right. And we tried to address it with them. One of them we've had great meetings with. Right. The other ones, we, you know, we, we would continue the discussions when, uh, but it's not meant to be unfriendly to anybody. And that's sure. Well, you know, of course, in a small town, Dick, and we're thinking, uh, obviously, this is not a small county, geographically yeah, the largest county in the state, but uh, <laughs> less than a quarter million people in the entire county, sure. 1,300 square miles. You know, we think about, as we were talking a little bit yesterday, you're involved in a community bank, in Crescent yeah. Bank, and, of course, we, we know some of those board members are. You know some of those officers yeah. are because we've seen them pictured on the crane or in other sure. places. <laughs> You've got guys like Edgerton Burroughs and others. I mean, a lot of folks right. that, I mean, a whole lot of folks around that are both welcoming of, uh, of other opportunities in the area, as well as oftentimes a lot of folks concerned about things happening. Sure. So the great thing is in a small community, there's a lot of hand-holding and a lot of folks working in tandem. Yes. Well, we've gotten a lot of support from council in the past, as I said, and I'm not saying that just, you know, to, to appease anybody. Because they really have been very sure. supportive. And, and I, it's understandable that there have been some problems in the past with what were perceived to be giveaways. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it seemed to me if you can get $14, 15000000 million instead of 80000 and what you put up is a uh, guaranteed by banks like, I don't know, BB&T, Wachovia, Bank of America, big banks with lots right. of money, right. then it seems to me it's, 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 like the count, it's like the community investing in a business. Yeah. But that's, it's, it's, it's not been proposed. It will not be proposed. 
unless there's some interest. And if the community doesn't want it, I don't think the council should support it. The council was supported on two previous votes. They're just a vote shy. Well, there's no question right, about right. building the park. We got support talk, on that. that I mean, that's not a problem. Right, right, right. No, we, we talked to everyone in the community. We had meetings. We talked to the neighbors. Everybody was happy. Right. And that's not a the, yeah. the bond issue is the only question. Sure. And as far as I'm concerned at this point, it has not been, we have not actually formally requested it. Right. And the probability is we won't. But we thought it was, if that, if that was a way to do something we thought was good for the community, we thought we ought to ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it's, doesn't appear as though the community is interested in doing it, which is fine. There's no, uh, there's no negative feelings or anything about it. Well, let's pr pray folks will contact you and give you, uh, give you the skinny to make sure you know for sure that the community is not interested in Well, I think in that, that the, the indication is that they aren't, and we, we're okay with that. But I think it would be wrong for us not to have asked. And it's certainly all right. To, it's understandable that there's a problem, and, and they don't want to. Good luck with however that turns out. Thank Dick, you. I hate to say we've run out of time, <laughs> no, and well, uh, there were so many things we wanted to ask you, and I hope you'll give us an opportunity to get you back. We also want to get Brenda in some time. I think she recently, or she's been on the board of Ori Georgetown Technical College Foundation for quite a while. It's had yes. long service there when we talk with about you. technical. I've recently joined the board, but I'd love to have the opportunity to get her in as well. well Thanks again. She's the better half of the family. Thank you. <laughs> you Thanks Mary. very much for allowing me to participate. Absolutely. That's great. Stay tuned to more Carolina People with Dick Rosen coming up next. Someone said if you want to learn about international finance or international trade talk to Dick Rose and we didn't get to talk about that I wanted to ask him if he wasn't the chairman of the board of the AVX corporation what he'd be doing we didn't have a chance to we did have an opportunity to talk about changes in the business the electronics business as well as capacitors over the last 46 47 years as well as thinking about that time growing up in Georgetown his first childhood job obviously the excitement of getting out and peddling flyers for the baseball team and then to think about expanding into dropping off refrigerators down dirt roads in Georgetown. The excitement was there at an early age. It continued in Boston and it continued at Cambridge, the opportunity to meet his, his bride-to-be and now bride of almost five decades. We didn't get to talk about what he does for every year to celebrate their wedding. We'll have to get him back another time to do that. Dick Rosen, thanks for being with us.